my great pleasure to invite Jim Tanzi today to give us a seminar. He's got an interesting title, which I'll come to at the minute. So uh, Jim is speaking to us from Saskatchewan today, which um, seems many miles away from our very hot and steamy weather. But um, Jim is a provincial entomologist. This means he works for the province, not that he's very provincial. And um, he, he's worked in sort of insect and pest management for uh, many years. Um, his understanding in Florida actually comes from when he uh, earlier was he worked down at the University of Florida in Immokalee at their research and uh, uh, education, uh, education center in Immokalee, where he was working on citrus, on psyllids. And he tells me he was working on um, foliar nutrition and also uh, suites of um, chemical control to try and maintain citrus trees through the psyllid infections. Um, he's not going to be talking to that uh, about that today to us. He, uh, he's going to give us a new talk, um, or at least new to us. And the title is really um, intriguing. It's uh, Migratory Insects Connecting the U.S. South and the Canadian Prairies. So, uh, Jim, over to you, and we're excited to hear what you have to tell us. And everybody, uh, please type your questions into the Q&A or the chat as we go along, and we'll take some time at the end to answer those questions. So, the, the uh, screen is yours, Jim. Okay, thank you very much, Hilary. Um, so, I guess just to preface, um, it's, it's important to think of, uh, of uh, North America and I guess, the, I guess the globe as a contiguous system. Uh, so that is, everything is connected. Uh, political boundaries are not terribly important to wild animals, including insects. Uh, so in, with that in mind, uh, just a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today, including insect migration with some specific examples. These will include the scale of movement uh, and uh, the, the scale of some of the, uh, the uh, uh, migratory movement of some of these animals is, is really quite, uh, quite striking. Um, we'll also talk about some insect pests that are shared by regions in a context of, uh, of insect migration and the scale of movement and how this factors into allowing us in the Canadian prairies to predict problems. And these are methods that are shared with, uh, with a number of you know, different jurisdictions around the world, including with, uh, with uh, our American counterparts. So uh, getting into uh, insect migration. Um, some species, as I mentioned before, move very long distances. Um, there are animals that will uh, cover in, uh, uh, as individuals, a uh, thousand kilometers a day, uh, which, which seems pretty remarkable for, for relatively small, uh, uh, small critters. Uh, uh, this can contribute to uh, overall mi migratory patterns of tens of thousands of kilometers. And we'll discuss uh, one or two examples from that. Uh, typically involves the movement of large numbers of individuals. So uh, although we can get movement of individuals, even small numbers of individuals uh, uh, associated with weather events, they can be lifted and moved with storms. Typically what we're talking or what we'll be talking about specifically today are, are uh, more broad scale population level uh, movements. Oh, pardon me. Uh, my other screen is demanding an update, so just let me close that so I can see the uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, summer and winter ranges uh, we'll be talking about because this is important. As I mentioned, uh, North America is a contiguous system. The globe is a contiguous system. Uh, so as far as the insects are, are concerned, it really has to do with, um, with the uh, um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, environmental uh, effects uh, associated with uh, with some of these uh, uh, movements. Uh, so we'll talk about se seasonal movement of populations. We'll talk about uh, uh, some of the distances that can, they can move, which can be very large. Um, oh, we have uh, a couple of raised hands. Uh, I'm happy to take questions during the during the presentation. Actually, I'm going to suggest that we'll hold all the questions to the end and just let you concentrate on giving your talk. And then we'll go through those raised hands and uh, through all the chat questions. Um, and I would remind everybody to put your questions into the Q&A and, &A and um, uh, we'll definitely get to them at the end or send them to Jim to answer after, this, uh, after the session. So keep going, Jim, please. 
Okay, uh, so uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, um, some of the large distances. It's important to consider too, and I mentioned this before, we can get movement of individuals and even large components of populations over relatively short distances, and this is relatively common. Um, typically, uh, these, uh, these movements are not associated with resource searching. So that is, they're not uh, taking flight looking for food as a rule. Uh, and that's the reason for the asterisk here, because for every rule, there are many, many exceptions. And we'll talk about some of those. So many examples of migration. Uh, most of the insect orders uh, will, will move around. And so we're talking 29 primary insect orders. Uh, many millions of, of insect species. So many moths, beetles, leaf, leaf hoppers, and a couple of uh, real good examples of dragonflies uh, that can move great distances. Um, so polymorphy is common, and I have a good example here. These are uh, desert locusts. And for the, those of you probably reading the news right now or hearing about uh, uh, an invasion in the Middle East and uh, now in India uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, desert and uh, migratory locust from, uh, from uh, from North Africa, uh, causing a lot of damage and a lot of concern. The UN has actually put out a call uh, for entomologists to come help with this uh, help with this problem. Uh, so uh, polymorphy is common uh, amongst these groups. And when, when I say polymorphy, I mean different forms. Uh, so in the case of these animals, the uh, the migratory locusts, typically they're they're you know uh, uh, not gregarious, they're solitary, uh, and their wings are are short enough for short flights. Uh, under conditions of resource stress, they, they'll produce uh, uh, forms with uh, uh, gregarious behavior that really like each other's company, tend to swarm, and with longer wings to allow them to, uh, to move great distances. And these would be considered the migratory forms. Uh, some can detect Earth, Earth's magnetic field as well. So and they have magnetite particles as part of their neurological system, and that, that allows them to, uh, to uh, maintain direction, uh, even in the absence of light. So uh, many of the ones that we're familiar with are considered boundary level migrants. So these, these are typically low altitude, uh, so wind speed typically lower than flight speed. So a lot of the, uh, the more charismatic species, monarch butterflies, for example, are considered to be boundary layer migrants. Uh, typically your larger day flying insects. These will typically use the sun for orientation. Uh, so there are a lot of examples in, uh, in the Hymenoptera. So that is the ants and bees and wasps using polarized light. Uh, to maintain uh, a direction for their, for their migrations. Monarch butterflies also use this as well, in addition to the magnetite. Typically day flyers, some are night flyers though too. So, so just to talk about the monarch, which is our classic example of a, of a migratory insect species. Uh, so uh, Danaeus pl uh, pl plexippus, uh, this is a milkweed specialist. Uh, so when we're talking about the milkweed family, we're talking 2,500 species of shrubs, herbs, and vines. Uh, monarch tends to specialize on uh, Asclepias uh, species, uh, and these are preferred. And there's, there, there are chemical associations and a coevolutionary relationship that dictates this. Uh, so the milky, la milky latex of the plant contains uh, uh, cardinalide card cardiac glycosides. Uh, so these are neurotoxins that stop vertebrate hearts. So they, they can be pretty toxic to, uh, to many animals. Uh, in the case of these ones, they sequester the toxins and they make the, uh, the uh, larvae and the adults uh, distasteful for predators and sometimes downright toxic, which is, which is a relatively common phenomenon amongst, uh, amongst uh, herbivorous insects. No such thing as a non-toxic plant is what I'm getting at. Uh, they all have, but uh, all have uh, different uh, means and mechanisms of defending themselves chemically. So looking at the monarch butterfly, you can see Florida here, which is a bit of an exception uh, uh, to, uh, to populations. Here we have northward and southward movement within Florida. The more typical case is this, uh, this movement to uh, forested regions in, uh, in uh, uh, north central Mexico and to coastal regions in California. Uh, the populations that we typically see in Saskatchewan uh, and they've underestimated the range here actually into Saskatchewan because they, they, they extend quite far north and uh, examples have been found as far north as the Northwest Territories. Uh, so I'll, I'll put up a map later just so you realize the scale of that, that migration. This is a multi-generational flight. So from their wintering grounds in North Central Mexico, say, uh, they will make it as far as uh, the Southern Midwest, uh, Oklahoma region uh, in the first generation, 
produce another generation on, on milkweed plants that makes it a little bit further. Uh, the next generation makes it a little bit further and so on. Uh, and then the fall migration for the, for the terminal generation, the one that arrives in Canada, uh, uh, takes flight in, uh, in, in the fall and works its way down again. Which is a relatively common phenomenon with, uh, with some, cre uh, some creatures. Uh, another really good example of a long distance migrant is the painted lady butterfly. Uh, so near cosmopolitan distribution, this is Vanessa Carduii, um, and you will see this one in Florida as well. Uh, also uh, relatively common throughout the central United States uh, and into the Canadian prairies. Uh, once again, near cosmopolitan distribution, uh, and this is one of the real champs of long distance, uh, long distance migration. We'll, we'll talk about that one in, in just a moment. Uh, the really unusual about, uh, thing about these animals is that they are constantly migrating and constantly mating. Uh, so they, they really are the gypsies of the, uh, of the insect world, uh, always on the move. Uh, another funny thing about these ones is they tend to lay eggs on plants that are more important for adult nutrition. So that is with resources that facilitate their continuous movement. So lots of sugars, lots of pollen, uh, uh, and they're happy to lay their eggs on really suboptimal hosts. So they really favor uh, quantity over quality for the next generation, which is a really unusual uh, way of approaching things. Uh, they tend to engage in northward movement in the, uh, in the spring from, their, uh, from the bulk of their geographic range. Uh, and uh, uh, this will be at a relatively uh, low uh, altitudes. However, their high altitude uh, southern return from Canada will be, or their return from Canada in the fall will be at high altitudes. And this wasn't well known as, until very recently. Uh, difficult to see when they're flying at, at heights of two kilometers. Uh, and I mentioned before, these are the real champs of long distance migration. So 15,000 kilometers in the old world from Scandinavia and Great Britain to West Africa. And this can take up to six generations. So we can see an example here of, uh, this is what the larva looks like. Uh, I, I wouldn't describe them as cute exactly, uh, but they are relatively, cons uh, relatively uh, conspicuous. And through the U.S. Midwest and, uh, and the, uh, the, the Prairie Province of, of Canada, uh, they attack soybean and canola and can be uh, a pest, uh, although they're, they're more showy than damaging. Both of these crops can actually take a lot of foliar damage, so that is feeding on the leaves uh, before they suffer any kind of yield hit. So our advice to growers is that despite the fact that they are pretty showy and seem to be causing a lot of damage to hold their fire as far as spray goes. Um, pretty unusual to see economic losses associated with this one. Their preferred host in my part of the world is Canada thistle, uh, which I've always thought is a really unfortunate name considering it's actually from uh, Central Asia, Kazakhstan region. Uh, I guess uh, some associated with, uh, with, with Canada, so Canada thistle it is. Uh, another important one here, and you can see by its range on the top right, uh, that it, it, it's, uh, it, it occurs into Florida as well, all the way up to the Northwest Territories through the Yukon and into Alaska. So a very widely dispersed uh, uh, grasshopper. This one can be very economically important, and uh, it's also one that engages in, uh, in uh, uh, polymorphy, that is long winged forms for migration and gregarious behavior and relatively shorter winged forms uh, when resources are plentiful. So much like you would see with a migratory or desert locust in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the old world. So Melanopus uh, sanguinipes, uh, or sanguinipes if you prefer, uh, in Western Canada, these hatch May to June in Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a decent sized animal, so 2.3 to 2.8 centimeters. So you know, roughly uh, the size of a pinky, uh, the size of a man's pinky. Uh, hind legs marked with black bands. That's what's very conspicuous about these animals. Uh, their uh, their uh, uh, host preferences are very broad uh, and there are a lot of crops that they will attack. So they feed on both grasses and broadleaf plants. Uh, they tend to not prefer canola. Canola is full of uh, um, uh, substance, uh, substances, pardon me, uh, called glucosinolates. And um, when glucosinolates are hydrolysis, uh, when you experience hydrolysis, so that that is there's a sugar moiety and there's a business end. And when the sugar moiety or the sugar end gets cut off of it by an enzyme, the business end gives you a, a zap that is, uh, uh, it's called the mustard oil bomb. 
And for those of you who've uh, eaten wasabi or horseradish, that's what you're experiencing. So you can see how that might dissuade a generalist herbivore uh, to be constantly eating, uh, eating uh, you know, really hot horseradish. Uh, so that's what they experience when they feed on plants in the cruciferae or the brassicaceae. So as I mentioned before, at high densities, these become, become gregarious. Uh, you can see adults here with wings. If it has wings, it's an adult, it's sexually mature and mobile. Uh, the nymph down below is what they look like when they're young, and as you can see, no wings. So I mentioned before, the migratory form has longer wings. Uh, there are accounts of adults swarming. It's relatively uncommon uh, and typically occurs where resources are patchy and, and unpredictable. Uh, so we do have some very, very dry areas in North America, including in southern Saskatchewan. When these areas experience uh, uh, periods of drought like we have experienced in the last couple of years, uh, you can see migratory behavior in these animals. Uh, they can be highly migratory in their re uh, pre-reproductive stage. So that is they're looking for good places to establish the next generation. They lay their eggs in the soil and they're really betting on the, uh, the, the conditions for the next season. Rainfall is a good indication of that. Pretty fast flyers, 10 to 12 miles per hour. And uh, under their own gas, they can cover about 60 miles a day. Uh, so migrations of 600 miles have been documented. They're generally low flyers, uh, but pilots of commercial jets have, uh, have run into uh, swarms at heights of uh, 13,000 feet. So they can be very fly high flyers as well. So that segues uh, into high altitude migrants, which is the bulk of what we typically see with, uh, with pests. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Great Plains of North America, including the, the, uh, the prairie provinces of Canada. These are typically, typically pushed by winds. Uh, so there, there are fast flowing winds at high altitudes and there's, there's a, a rough geometric relationship between altitude and wind speed. And wind speeds at high altitudes can be very, very, uh, very high despite relatively calm conditions on the surface. Some of these animals can fly hundreds of meters in the air. And uh, as I mentioned before, some can be in the kilometers ranges. So most migratory insects fall into this category. And one that's very important in, uh, in uh, Western North America uh, is the diamondback moth. And you can see the adults here uh, perched next to a, a canola flower. Uh, and you can see the conspicuous diamond pattern on its back, how it gets its name. These are very small animals. This, this is probably about a, is about a centimeter long. Uh, you can see the larvae here and the pupa. Uh, you can also see uh, there is a wasp stinging a, a, a diamondback larva. And this is actually an important biological control of this animal. This is Diadegma insulaire, does not overwinter in Canada, and it actually tracks populations of diamondback as they take flight. So in addition to the pests, you also have their contingent of predators following them as well, sometimes at high altitudes. So diamondback is an important uh, pest of, uh, of cruciferous crops. So that is uh, crucifer cruciferous veggies. Uh, uh, in Florida as well, uh, all through North America and, uh, and throughout the world. If they're growing mustard in, Indi in India, they have problems with this animal. Uh, it overwinters very poorly in Saskatchewan, however. Uh, less than 1% of the population can survive the cold here. Uh, however, uh, with the invasion from southern latitudes every year, we can see up to five generations per year. Early arrival and big numbers can mean problems for farmers here. And as we've seen this year, we had a very early arrival, uh, started seeing big populations in April. So the population of five generations per year, uh, populations increase very quickly. And of course you get, you get a, a, a near exponential growth of, of populations. So for, uh, for growers in Western Canada, they should be scouting late May to early September and weekly July to August. So about this time of year, uh, is when the damage can really accumulate. So as I mentioned before, it's a little bit chilly in Saskatchewan in the winter. Uh, so these are mean temperatures. Uh, I was at a meeting in December of this past year um, that was minus 52 for a couple of days uh, without much snow cover. So uh, it was really, really, really cold. Uh, so yeah, moving, moving from the hotel to the conference center was, uh, was an adventure that you could see a lot of people running. Uh, warm temperatures in the summer that are probably similar or are similar to what you would experience in Florida in the winter. 
So uh, primary uh, economic uh, problems associated with salmon are associated with canola. So it's uh, canola is an acronym. So Canada Oil Low Acid, and that's refer referring to uh, erucic acid. Um, so the glucosinolates and the erucic acid, acid have been minimized through breeding um, and uh, to make for good cooking oil and, uh, and meal for animal feed. Uh, you can see the damage associated with this to flower buds. You can see some larvae feeding on the pods and some, and some damage to, uh, to leaves. Uh, foliar damage, not terribly important to canola, but canola is a big crop in Saskatchewan. So that is 11.3 million acres grown in 2020. Uh, to the point that this is a view from, uh, from Landsat, so a view from space. You can see the canola fields growing in Alberta and Saskatchewan from space. Uh, so lots and lots of canola. Bright yellow flowers make it very conspicuous. But it gives you an idea of the acreage. Uh, Saskatchewan is roughly four times the size of Florida uh, by acreage. So some big distances. So if we're talking about populations moving from Florida, so uh, to uh, Saskatchewan, so Immokalee to Saskatoon, 3,600 kilometers or 2,200 miles uh, as the moth flies. So they can cover a thousand kilometers a day, uh, pushed along by high altitude winds. Uh, they're relatively good flyers, but uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing speeds for a very small insect. So some differences in habitat, but winter uh, in Florida, as I mentioned before, is pretty similar to summer in Saskatchewan. Uh, so this is uh, near Immokalee, Florida. This is a broccoli field. Broccoli is currently a, a, a minor use crop in, in Florida or a, a crop of minor importance, but it is becoming more important uh, as are other coal crops uh, for, uh, for winter season. Uh, in, uh, in Saskatchewan, of course, canola is king. Uh, that uh, in mind, of course, I have a picture of a potato field here, uh, which has nothing to do with diamondback moth. Uh, so this is from the Capel Valley, uh, which is a, a bit of a funny name. French explorers uh, had a sense of humor Capel is uh, uh, translates roughly to uh, whatchamacallit. So it's the whatchamacallit valley of Saskatchewan. So you can see comparable mean temperatures. Uh, the thing uh, that's uh, a big difference is day length. Uh, we, we have 16 hour days here, uh, whereas you'll, you'll probably have 13 to 14 hour days there in the summer. So these are transported by high, high altitude winds, as I mentioned, and this is associated with sustained advection. So that is the transfer of matter you get channels of air that connect portions of the uh, portions of, uh, of North America. And as I mentioned before, long distance flight is, uh, is uh, quite common. Uh, the ones that we typically see in Saskatchewan are generally from the US Pacific Northwest. So that is Oregon and Washington, also from Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. Uh, those in Ontario and Quebec uh, are generally connected by these high altitude parcels of air uh, to the American Southeast. However, one big exception in 2001, which was an outbreak here, uh, there was sustained connectivity between Florida and Georgia and Louisiana and uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, so uh, point A to point B vectored by high altitude winds. This is what the track of uh, some of these high altitude winds look like. And you can see that the, uh, the heights that, uh, that these animals are moving at uh, can be pretty amazing. So 3,000 meters, so roughly 9,000 feet. Um, Pretty cold at those at those heights as well. So real high, uh, real uh, uh, high winds and cold temperatures. Uh, so a pretty hostile environment, and they seem to survive it uh, in great numbers. So you can see from their from their uh, sources of origin in southern Texas, uh, moving through uh, through the northeast of the United States and uh, up into Saskatchewan and Manitoba, all on high altitude winds. So uh, currently we track these, uh, these high, altitude, uh, high altitude winds from specific Canadian locations. Uh, and so these have been monitored since, since the 1990s, since a major outbreak uh, in, the, in the, the mid 1990s, where the fundamental question is, where are all these moths coming from? Uh, and so that began some of the work with these reverse trajectory models. Uh, and these are used by us for early warning of uh, origin and destination of migratory species, including di uh, diamondback moth. It, it'll give us some predicting power in, of infestation and the intensity of connectivity. So it lets us know how, 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 how much A and B are truly connected. Uh, just as an example, Pacific Northwest of the United States 
uh, June 16 to 22 this past year, we had 40 to 49 reverse trajectories uh, from Idaho, Oregon, and Washington that crossed over prairie locations and were potential sources. We also had a system of sentry sites throughout the, throughout the province, uh, and these are synthetic sex pheromone based. Um, so you can see this is uh, called a, a delta trap, uh, roughly D-shaped, uh, and at the top of that you see a little gray septum hanging. Uh, this is spiked with, uh, with a synthetic sex pheromone. Uh, reason uh, that the pheromone is so important to these animals is that when, when you're this big, a centimeter long, it's really tough for boy to meet girl in a big wide world. So what the female does is climb to the top of a plant. Oh, one thing that's important to mention as well is these animals are crepuscular. So they're active at dawn and dusk. So they don't work with a whole lot of light. So they're prim primarily olfactory searchers. So they smell with their antennae and they're gonna use those smells to orient themselves to each other and to potential host plants. So what the girls are gonna do is climb to the top of a plant and uh, there's no delicate way to say it, but stick their bum in the air. And what they're doing is calling to males and they're releasing sex pheromone. And he's gonna pick those up with his antennae. He has a little switch in his brain and as the little switch goes off, he's powerless to resist. Uh, you can, whatever conclusions you'd like to draw with human populations, uh, you know, feel free. Um, he will orient, or, orient himself into the wind, point himself uh, into the wind and take flight. He will cast left and right, and as he's running into molecules of these uh, of the sex pheromone with his uh, with his antennae, the concentration gets higher. His casting gets more narrow until it gets almost linear. And boy meets girl, beautiful music plays, and they contribute to the next generation. So what we've done is is uh, hijack the system fun fun fundamentally. So we synthesize the sex pheromone that the female produces. And we basically take what he thinks is going to be the best day of his life and turn it into the worst day of his life. And he gets stuck to one of these blue boards inside the, one of these delta traps. So that's, that lets us know the, the time of arrival of these animals and the relative prevalence. Part of the problem is that we're only catching males, right? This is, this is a, a female specific sex pheromone. Only the males are responding to it. Um, yeah, there's some indication from old world populations that males and females may not fly at the same time. Uh, so it isn't a, a true one-to-one -one relationship of trap catch and local pressures. So, but it does give an indication of time of arrival and potential intens intensity of arrival and lets us uh, inform uh, local growers to, uh, to, to be on the lookout and when to scout. Another important one that, uh, that is uh, 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 another migrant from the States uh, is uh, Macrocelis quadra lineas, the aster leafhopper. Uh, this is another canola pest, and the reason that it's important is that it vectors a phytoplasma, or a bacteria-like organism that, uh, that causes uh, a disease called aster yellows. And you can see this growth on this canola plant. You may not even recognize it as... Uh, as a canola plant, these, uh, these uh, odd growths are where flowers should be. Uh, the business end of a canola plant, of course, is seed production. This one will not produce seeds. So this can be a very important uh, uh, problem. Uh, also a high altitude migrant. Here are the life stages of this animal. So the little nymphs uh, going through a number of instars. So uh, the term instar refers to the, to the uh, intermolt period. So to go from one size to another, the insect molts, or that is sheds its suit of armor, and, uh, and uh, this allows it to continue to grow. Uh, you can see the adult here, and as I mentioned before, wings. So it has wings, it's an adult. Of course, not all, not all adults have wings, but all creatures, all, uh, all insects with wings are adults. Once again, the wind trajectory is associated with this one. Uh, this is more of a Pacific Northwest example. And you can see these ones moving from, uh, from, uh, um, uh, from the Yakima Valley in Washington uh, to the Moose Jaw area. Uh, yes, a, a number of funny named uh, places uh, that you don't think about very much when you say them a lot, but uh, yeah, Moose Jaw is a bit of a funny name. Uh, so May 9th arrival uh, was predicted and confirmed with trapping uh, from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we also have uh, a, a series of sentry sites with yellow sticky cards. Uh, these are visual uh, day flyers, uh, or sort of visual searchers. So you can see the big beautiful eyes, um, and they use those for host association and host finding. 
Uh, yellow is considered to be a super normal stimulus for, a lot, for uh, uh, anthophilus insects, or that is insects that feed on flowers or are attracted to flowers. Uh, so yellow, big, uh, big yellow flower, and uh, voila, he gets stuck to a blue board. It's hard to be a bug sometimes. Uh, another important example of, uh, of a migratory insect that, we're, that we uh, are currently conducting research on is the pea aphid. Uh, this animal has become more important uh, in Canada with the increase in pulse crops. Uh, so pulses are uh, peas, lentils, chickpea, and faba. Uh, the, the bulk of these are shipped to India. Uh, so uh, India has a, an almost inexhaustible appetite for, uh, for, uh, for pulses. Uh, also becoming more important in uh, in North America, and I'm sure uh, many of you have experienced uh, 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 lentil soup uh, uh, or chickpeas. Uh, of course, um, uh, Mexican cooking, uh, cooking, pardon me, is uh, is uh, is rich in chickpea uh, 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 content. Uh, another name for them is, for chickpea is garbanzo bean. Uh, these have piercing sucking mouth parts. They feed on the lower on lower leaf surfaces and cause uh, yellowing and wilting. Uh, they can reduce yield, but typically don't reduce quality, and they can reduce yield dramatically. Uh, they can also be important vectors of plant disease. So just looking at the top here, you can see uh, there's uh, uh, the allate form or the winged form. So this is a winged adult. Uh, so this is another example of uh, all with wings are adults, but not all, all adults have wings. Uh, the, uh, there are two primary color morphs, a pink and a green. And you can see the large girl on the uh, left side of that stem there, that is also an adult, uh, no wings. So they produce wings at certain points in the season. What they do that's uh, really interesting as well, you can see there's a, 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 an aphid there squeezing out a baby. Uh, so they give birth to live young and they don't require fertilization to do that. Uh, so what she is doing is producing a clone. So mother, to daughter, to granddaughter, and down the line are all clones. Uh, it makes for very rapid uh, increase in populations. Uh, so uh, 15 generations per year are possible and uh, at four to 12 young per day and seven to 12 days for adults, uh, uh, for, for adult from birth. When she's gonna start producing daughters, you can see the potential for really rapid population increase. Uh, this process of producing clones is called parthenogenesis, and it is fun functionally self-cloning. They also, however, uh, have a sexual phase. Um, so beginning with overwintering, they overwinter to a, low ex a low, relatively low extent in Saskatchewan as eggs. Uh, the winter seems to kill off most of the, uh, the overwintering eggs. From that, they'll produce asexual females, which go through this parthenogenesis to produce daughters and granddaughters and great uh, granddaughters. Uh, if they experience a lot of crowding uh, or the host quality falls, uh, that is they, they start killing their host plant, they will produce a generation of winged daughters uh, that can take flight to find new host plants. When the daylight shortens, uh, this stimulates the production of males. So they'll eliminate one of the X chromosomes uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the progeny and produce both sexual females and sexual males. These reproduce in the standard fashion, uh, that is ovum and sperm cell, to produce the, uh, the overwintering egg and allow that genetic mixing. So uh, winged forms, non-winged forms, and environmental conditions that, that uh, influence the production of, of winged and non-winged forms, including host plant quality and day length. So a relatively complex life cycle. Uh, a lot of aphids will actually engage in host shifting, shifting as well and will overwinter on completely different plant families than they would feed on in the summer. So aphids are a very old group. Uh, they're a much older group than the dinosaurs. Um, oh, pardon me. My, uh, my computer has decided that it may be time to log off. Uh, apologies if I uh, have some difficulties with this. Um, so uh, just an example from Faba. Uh, this is uh, an experiment that was conducted last year and the year before, and we have another one on the, on, uh, ongoing this summer. Uh, so this is insecticide application to Faba bean, and you can see the damage that these uh, are. Well, That's we were right, yeah. really... 
we're really enjoying your um, seminar, but I think we'll have to switch to the questions and I could read them to you if you would like me to do that without, um, or oh, Laura, do you have his PowerPoint? I do not. Okay. No, so as, we'll a, as a matter Sorry, as a matter of fact, that, that, that was my last subject matter slide. Oh. Uh, so, oh. yeah, so it was, yeah, as, as luck would have it. So, uh, yeah, I apologize for the delay. My, my computer decided that it would prefer to be a toaster and, uh, and, is, uh, and is currently engaged in toaster function. So uh, I sincerely apologize to the audience and, 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 to, the, and to the host. Well, we we extend we extend our um, uh, you know sympathies because we've all been through this, and there are still sixty one people hanging in there listening to you. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to read some questions to you. Uh, there's several in the um, and uh, see if you can just respond over the phone for us. So the first oh, question sure. yeah, is. I, sorry, sorry, just a moment. If I if I could address the pre the previous comment uh, oh, yeah. about uh, yeah, the, the the weather events and uh, and perceived damage to to to, uh, to insects. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, you know, it, uh, uh, um, that that is a valid point, but but there are some caveats to that, of course, uh, and some and some relatively interesting caveats as well. So um, I, I did my uh, my doc work on uh, on an animal called the cabbage seed pod weevil, and uh, looking at climate factors and and how those influenced uh, the movement of this animal. It is an invasive, so one of the one of the fundamental questions was what are the factors that are contribute to, contributing to its invasiveness. And one of the things that we found was that uh, um, um, uh, times of high humidity and uh, and uh, uh, so relatively warm, sticky conditions would actually contribute to their to their flight behavior. Would would actually promote flight with these animals. And the thinking was uh, that they would be pushed along by storms, and and this this would help with relatively long distance dispersal. Uh, these animals are relatively weak flyers uh, as far as insects go. Uh, but the, the second it started raining, uh, these 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 critters would hunker down. Uh, you know, they're they're about three or four millimeters long, and you can appreciate that. Uh, you know, getting hit by a raindrop when you're when you're that big could be a life-altering event. So, uh, so sorry, I, I just wanted to, uh, to to raise that no. point, and I can I can address the question. Yeah, we were trying to fill in the best we could for you. So thank you very much. much thanks to Elizabeth. Yeah. Thanks to Elizabeth for yeah, answering you. that. So I'm going to move you, on Elizabeth. through some of the other questions. Um, so uh, here's an early one. If soybeans and canola farmers leave thistle, and I presume that means Canadian thistle plants uh, to grow yeah. in their fields, instead of using herbicides to create perfect monocultures, would the thistle draw the painted ladies? So I think this is a conservation about painted ladies question. Uh, of course, no, and I, I think that's, that's, that's an excellent point. Uh, and, uh, Part of the rub with Canada thistle is that uh, it is a perennial plant, deep rooted, and it can be very competitive. Um, so, so it's one where if if a grower doesn't get on top of it, um, it's very difficult to control, even with chemical means. Uh, and um, there there are legal obligations for for a grower to control it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, I, I understand the the the, the point uh, uh, that's being made. Um, I guess part part of the problem is that Canada thistle in itself is an invasive, and so we have an obligation both for, from a, for, okay. from a, yeah. an agricultural perspective and from a natural history perspective to uh, to uh, to eradicate it or try to control it. Uh, there are native thistles that Painted, Painted Lady will take advantage on as well, and, and many of these have protected status. Um, so, you know, the conservation of natural areas will protect Painted Lady butterflies and these native thistles as well. Thanks. So this is a question from Paul Gray in the chat. And I wanted to ask this question as well, so I was really glad he asked it. How do you know an insect in Florida came from Canada or vice versa? Are there some kind of chemical markers, I guess, my, or maybe stable isotopes or something that you can use to make that connection? Yeah, uh, yeah yes to both. And, and actually, some of that work is ongoing. Uh, when I when I was in uh, you know, doing my postdoc in Florida working on uh, on citrus, of course, uh, you know you maintain with in contact with old colleagues and and uh, was uh, in contact with uh, some uh, Agriculture Canada uh, uh, colleagues uh, who were doing work on diamondback moth, and so I sampled some populations in Florida for them, uh, with the assumption that uh, or the you know, the the, uh, the the intent that uh, a postdoc 
in uh, in Canada would do the molecular work to determine uh, you know potential for for that as a source population for Western Canadian populations. So so to that yes there are molecular markers that can be assessed to to evaluate different populations, uh, and there is uh, uh, current work ongoing uh, with uh, uh, deuterium content with mm -hmm. uh, with aphid populations and this this work is uh, still in still in its early stages but different regions of north america are characterized by different levels uh, and this can be indicative of the of the source of those populations uh, much much like stable isotope work so um uh, next question um are there also cases of migration to and from central and south america and the caribbean uh, yes, uh, I mean, that falls a little outside of my wheelhouse, unfortunately. Uh, I, I would love to comment on on those. Uh, unfortunately, my my area of expertise is limited to North America, uh, primarily the Can Canadian prairies. Well, I will add that there's a lot of comments in the chat saying, I had no idea um, insects were moving this far. So I think uh, you might inspire a lot of us to do a little bit more uh, literature searching and um, uh, Googling on our own to find out more information about that. So appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad um, for that, yeah. So a uh, question here, what eats pea aphids? What are the predators of pea aphids? Do ladybug larvae or lacewing larvae? And I think there are some comments in the chat where people have been commenting on this, like green anoles uh, snacking on aphids. So over to you, what, what? eats what eats the aphids? Uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, ladybirds, uh, uh, adults and larvae, lacewing uh, uh, larvae for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also have a, a, a complex of parasitoids. Uh, so um, I guess just just for for clarity's sake, uh, 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 to make, uh, draw a distinction between a parasitoid and a parasite. Uh, a parasite, uh, by definition, doesn't kill its host. It's uh, it's actually not terribly hard on its host. A parasito a parasitoid actually kills its host by definition. So you remember that wasp that, that I had uh, the, the figure of uh, diadegma attacking the diamondback larva. That's a good example of a parasitoid. So aphids have uh, a, a, a complex of, uh, of parasitoids in the genus Aphidius. Uh, and what these do is um, uh, they, they sting the aphid. And when they sting the aphid, they, they inject some venom and, uh, and uh, an egg. And uh, this, uh, this larva grows up inside of the, uh, of the uh, developing aphid. It you know, cleans out the inside and uh, leaves a husk on the outside that we call a mummy. Uh, it chews a little door in the outside of the aphid, opens up the door, and uh, and out pops an adult wasp. Uh, these are very small wasps, though, so I, I mean you, you can appreciate the size of an aphid. Uh, so the adult wasp actually uh, emerges from that aphid. So very small wasps. Most wasps are very small, but 90% of the wasps are, are are the parasitica or parasitic wasps and roughly a million species thereabouts described worldwide of wasps. So ants and bees and wasps all in the same group. So, Sorry, that was probably more, a little more than the No, no, it's all so good. Wanted, this, is a, this is a fact hungry audience. Um, and we've oh, got okay. five minutes left if you're, if you're willing to hang in for that. Um, so do, person, yeah. thanks. Uh, do summer fast moving winds or storms like a derecho um, accelerate insect migration. Yeah, I, we, um, that's more complicated because the, the, the high winds on the surface tend to limit insect flight, which is really interesting. Okay. Uh, Diamondback is really good is a really good example of this. Um, uh, so, uh, if you have high winds and the presence of adults, they will tend to hunker down, and and it doesn't take very much, like a six mile an hour wind will be enough to limit flight of these animals where they just hunker down. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, they're relatively delicate, they get bashed around pretty good. Uh, but if it's relatively warm and calm on the surface and they can take flight and, and, and make it to those high altitudes, they can get pushed along by the high altitude winds. So surface winds tend to limit flight, high altitude winds tend to promote motion. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm jumping ahead to Scott, um, who was curious about the monarch migration map in regards to Florida. I think he's asking a question, mm. are, there, are there just basically strictly within Florida migrants? What's the deal if you're a monarch in Florida? What are your options? 
Yeah, I think it's, it's northward movement and southward movement. So the, the mm-hmm. overall, the population does seem to be limited to Florida. My understanding is there a little there there can be some mixing with my with migratory populations in North Florida, but for but for the most part, it is a uh, it is a uh, um, uh, an intact population. Okay, so we have a question here um, from Stephanie, um, and I'm going to add a bit to your question, Stephanie, if you don't mind. Um, how has climate change affected insect migrations in general? And I'd like to add a little bit more. We, many of us have probably read about the uh, sort of insect Armageddon reported in Germany and Europe. So have we, mm. uh, have we seen, you know, is climate change associated with uh, big changes in insect populations? What are you seeing from your data in Canada? Oh, boy, that's such a big question. Um, Sorry. Just, yeah, I guess... <laughs> To, 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 to this, well, no, I, I, I'm happy happy to address that, but uh, I may I may go on for a little while. Uh, so, so yeah, the, uh, the the German study very interesting, and I, it's a, to my recollection, they were looking at a 75 percent decrease in biomass uh, associated with flying insects, and I think a lot of what they attributed that to was the overuse of insecticides okay. and the potential for uh, and, and the contributions of of, uh, of uh, reduced. Uh, host, host plant diversity and that contributing to, to, to that effect as well. So um, there, there are definite anthropogenic causes that don't necessarily have to do with climate change. Uh, but I've been reading articles recently more on migratory birds and, and how this relates to, uh, to uh, migratory insects uh, about changes in, in some of these these high altitude uh, wind patterns associated with climate change, and and the, 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 there's far from it's far from a consensus uh, on on exactly what's happening here. Uh, only that there there do seem to be some changes afoot, and they do seem to have the potential to influence migratory birds. Um, if it's they're influencing migratory birds, and I think the potential to influence migratory insects are there as well. I think the 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 big factor that's going to influence um, some of these migratory uh, insects, uh, particularly particularly those with uh, multiple generations um, uh, over over you know the the, the contiguous uh, uh, North America, is uh, the extended host range of some plants, including crop plants. So if you get a, a, a northern movement of you know say soybean and corn, I mean when, when I was a kid, you never saw soybean and corn growing in Western Canada, and it, and it's really quite common now. Um, especially in southern latitudes, uh, which I realize southern Canada, Canada sounds a bit, a bit funny from a Florida perspective, but uh, um, but you do see northern movement of different crops with a warming climate and, and with improved agronomics as well. So the, the improvement of cold of cold tolerant crops. Um, so that could have an effect. Uh, you're also going to see you know different geographic distribution of other host plants as well. Uh, wild host plants that are going to be influenced by ch- influenced by changes in climate. Well, so um, it's, yeah, that's a <laughs> well. You said it was complicated, so thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a big question. Yeah. It's uh, 4.29, everybody, uh, so we're getting close to our witching hour um, uh, at 4.30. Um, I think uh, Laura is going to grab some of those questions, and maybe, maybe Jim, you would be, um, with Dr. Tanza, you would be willing to help us answer those via email if we don't have time, as we don't have time to get to all of them. I'd like to say thank you very much. I'm so glad we got through everything but the penultimate slide in your um, everything. We were at the penultimate slide in your presentation. It was really interesting, and I certainly oh, okay. learned a lot from it. I'm sure everybody else did. And um, I'd like to thank our participants for joining us and hanging in there. There was a very mod- large number that made it through to the end. Um, so uh, uh, sorry about the technical glitches, but uh, we, we, uh, we seem to have muddled through. So thank you very much for hanging in there, everybody. And again, thank you, Dr. Tansi. It was a great presentation. Oh, thank, thank, you, for, thank you for your time and, and for the invitation. Uh, my my mm-hmm. computer is going to get such a scolding when, when I get off the phone. So. Yeah, my my observation is they never respond well to that. <laughs> no, no. Okay, everybody. Um, yeah.